I love the way it looks. As long as you get a container without any dents and dings, which is referred to as a one trip container, that means they're selling it for such a high price that they could just buy another container and fill it up in China and then they can introduce that into the fleet. But people pay a premium for those. It's almost two and a half times more than a container that's been around the world for 20 years. Now, you may ask yourself, is there value in that? I think there is. Because what is the cost of typical siding on a building? Okay. Well, multiply that by the fact that each container is either 40 or 45 feet long and nine and a half feet tall. So your cost for the container, when you actually take that and compute that into, into savings on your roof and savings on your siding and savings on your subfloor and savings on, on your end wall siding, okay, if you want to keep the container as it is, it's incredibly efficient. It's fantastic, you know, because it saves you the cost of drywall finishing and, and, and all that ultimately. The shipping container itself, uh, the structural, uh, the members that you're using for structural integrity are the flooring and in some cases the side walls or end walls and then the roof where it's still retained. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And right. then you just add pieces to it to then stabilize okay. all that material. In, in this case here, uh, I hear people talking about piers and things. I, I'm not sure we even got into discussions of the foundation or if you'd be driving piles using pile caps. Then you would just set the shipping container on top of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, uh, because you're going to have concrete that's going to be around this classroom. That, yeah, that's uh, a whole another topic. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So, okay, I, I just wanted to understand how you would integrate that shipping container in the overall construction. Yes. And one other question. When you talk about a continuous pour, uh, are you cutting, soft cutting expansion joints in there, uh, you know, between the containers? Because obviously the concrete's going to expand and contract. To me, that right between the shipping, you know, yeah. that's the perfect place for the major. And you know, you want them every about four to five feet. So I'm sure that's part of the process that you're asking him. Yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm just asking it in general. I, I appreciate your feedback on it. And yeah, because that, we haven't discussed that. Yeah. About dealing with the practicality. For sure. Of, of that was my thought of leaving the steel exposed. Yeah. There, there was another one. If you could go to the other picture, uh, Russell, please. There was one that I thought had, you could see the floor. Yeah, that yeah, one. So that, yeah. And you see the green stripes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm assuming that's the steel. It is. And so then you replace the wood in between with the concrete, mm -hmm. and that steel becomes my expansion joint. Okay. And I've got a basically a continuous slab. You might have to cut some, score some lines uh, sideways on that. It looks like a beam running across yeah. overhead. That's probably the bottom the framework for the and framework the framework for the bottom the Those top the and the bottom rails. Mm -hmm. yeah the top and bottom structural rails mm -hmm. i love that i love that with uh, exposed and i think that we're all about that exposing the structure exposing the system that the kids can say this is the bottom rail of our shipping container and into in, interior on a continuous pour interior i don't think you would i don't think it would require an expansion joint other than the thresholds of the doorway and the wall just because it's only going to be a dimension of what we say 24 ultimately 24 by 40 and as long as that stays climate controlled the expansion and contraction of an interior pour of concrete is very minimal that's why you can get by with larger interior pours with of, of, of concrete with a smooth finish with a smaller aggregate in it uh, the only time that expansion and contraction gaps happen is when you go from like a garage into a house you know a lot of times on that foundation because a lot of people don't heat and cool their garage or the exterior parking lot driveway um, patios and different things like that because that's what takes the brunt if there's no expansion and contraction if there's very little temperature change i mean if you're talking about working within maybe an extreme low of 55 degrees an extreme high of 80 i mean i don't know what the lows, I don't know what you would keep the school at in the summer, or maybe over Christmas break, I don't know, but that would probably be the lowest over Christmas break and the highest over the summer is what I'm guessing. Yeah. You're not going to get a huge expansion and contraction of materials after it's actually cured. If you take a, a, a retail building mm -hmm. and you may have columns that are either uh, 40 feet on center or 25 feet on center, mm -hmm. you still put in the construction joints because you will get that expansion. And, and contraction due to the mass of the concrete. 
um, and and so you put it in there so that your your concrete doesn't your floor doesn't spall and and you don't get the cracks in it. Go into any lows or whatever, and you'll see cracks all over the place. And 